Hi, people out there in the world watching videos on the internet that have to do with cars. Welcome to this. My 1991 Toyota MR2 Turbo, AKA Mr. Dose. If you're new and you like to get caught up on, that was good timing. The last video where I worked on this thing up above my head is either a link to that video or also could be a scratch and sniff soup menu. <laughs> I have numerous things I need to do in today's video, but the first is happening purely because I know it's been driving some of you insane for the past two years. In case you were wondering, that's actually metal that is painted. Ouch, that's my bone. Ta-da! And for those of you that don't aren't up to speed on Japanese cars in the 90s, don't really know the significance of what these wheels and what they even are, they are a Desmond Regamaster Evo. These are the newer models that are made in Japan. They're a forged monoblock wheel and they are of the era of this car. That's why I went with them. And the red and white theme is a nod to Toyota's racing livery from the 90s, like the most badass car that you could have in Gran Turismo back in the day. And whilst I'm at it, I might as well address another issue that's been bugging me in this area. To match the new brake pads and brake lines, Racing Floating Nut, imported from Japan, not sponsored, purchased these because they matched in the theme of the car. Floating not because of its buoyancy, but floating because of its rotational C. And what's super fancy about these lug nuts and part of the reason why I chose them, with this special little key, the inner core is actually anodized aluminum and removable with a little o-ring in case you want to run an extended stud which i have or if it ever gets seized you can spray some brake free inside there in summary even though the old nuts got the job done it's the icing on the cake in the end that needs to be the freshest <laughs> What I like about these is from about 10 feet away, you can't even tell there's any color on them. They just look like a black lug nut. But these tiny little elements of color tie into the confetti pattern on the fabric of the Recaro seats. This, if you haven't been able to tell already by the color of the cardboard, is from Japan. Contains glass. Now this is not sponsored. I chose it purely for the same reason why you choose delicious beverages with particular meats and cheeses. It is a Cusco oil catch can. However, if you notice on the application list where it says Toyota MR2, it only lists the AW11 generation. So I purchased the kit for a GR4 Corolla. Do the fabrication music. Bracket shapes. This little reservoir is where the oil is collected. There's a little sight glass right here so you can see the level. The bracket slides into this little notch right here. I feel like I should be whistling the X-Files theme while I'm doing this. I don't know why. Uh, this shape has to be made to fit the other shapes. Down in this vicinity is where the original air box as well as coolant neck went. You can see on this transmission mount bracket there are some threaded spots. Which is why I chose the one for a GR4 Corolla because of the bottom. Some of my OGs out there might know this but I do think Cusco used to make a catch can for these back in the day. That could go there but that's not really that pretty. Right here that is perfect. Which just barely tucks under the side blade panel. Now, that will slow. Oh yeah, that's sick. I'm gonna make a bracket for a Japanese part going on a Japanese car. I'm gonna use Japanese cardboard. It kind of reminds me of Hawaiian bread. I got a mounting location right there. Oh, it's the same height. Well, fancy. This bracket must be the same width for it to be correct. Well, the catch can itself isn't very heavy. It needs the top bracket to keep it stabilized so that you don't induce cracks on the lower mount from the engine and transmission vibrating. That's perfect. Bracket template. Unfortunately, there is no longer a custom barbecue grill shop next door with a big plasma table and I can't afford one of those little mini plasma tables. The hose that comes with this kit looks like something that a miniature ferret would crawl through. It's got some steel spiral in there. Yep right here. Oh, this is how you get bruises. There we go. Like that. I'm using dry erase marker so that way it's easy to clean. This is an interesting material to try to cut. Dry erase marker clean 
Let's bring it up. One would only assume that this is gonna get dingy and yellow and nasty with oil flowing through it, but I've owned this car about seven years now and I've probably put about 500 miles on it since. All I do is work. I don't ever have time to do anything fun. Making vlogs just seems narcissistic. Like who cares about my life? So I'll just work until I die for you. You're welcome. Holy crap. I don't know why I'm so obsessed with this translucent blue tape. About like right there. This dry erase marker smells weird. Ouch. There. This. No lube was not a good idea. I need to get some clips that will hold these. For those of you that are a little bit confused on the purpose of an oil catch can, where most vehicles do have a PCV valve, on these second generation turbo MR2s, they just had a hose that would ventilate the crankcase vapors back into the intake track. So this vessel collects any of the oil vapors so it's easily dumpable rather than putting it into your engine and gunking up your intake valves and turbo. Field trip time. Hello. This morning on the way to the shop, I found the custom barbecue grill shop. They moved a couple miles down the road and I now have a bracket. Ta -da! A bracket has been fabricated. I changed it up a little bit. This is stainless. The original ones are just regular steel because when in doubt, go all out. It looks like this is going to be an exact match to the Cusco blue. I am going to upgrade the upgrade because it doesn't matter what you're, you're in, upgrade's gonna find your ass. You're pretty dumb sometimes. Unplug, unplug. Well, the biggest challenges I ran into with this car after I got it up and running again was inadequate cooling capabilities. While I've never had it overheat on me, it does tend to start to run hot if I let it sit in traffic for too long. And while I do have upgraded aftermarket fans on here, the ones I recently purchased are on the fringe of what the factory wiring is capable of handling amperage wise, which is really not smart. So I have a new solution, however, it's complicated. Ooh, heavy. The downside of these beefy, powerful fans I upgraded to is at startup, they're close to 35 amps draw a piece. The solution for that, that is a super tiny snap ring. I don't even know if my pliers will get it. Yep. The motors that I'm replacing them with do a maximum 1,356 CFM at only eight and a half amps maximum draw. And that CFM was based upon a two inch smaller diameter fan blade than what's about to have. You can swap that out. It should fit, I think, I hope. Cord has to go out there. Even though this is reverse thread, it's getting red lock tight. It spins. There you go, brushless fan. And just like that, I have enough CFM to suck the hair off your feet with only half the amperage draw of a factory fan. This has literally lost half of the weight of those giant motors that were on there. Well, that goes just like that. Where's the plugs? Where's the plugs? Tightening beveled Allen head bolts with your bare fingers is a fun experience. These things are razor sharp. So when I did my wire-in standalone ECU on this thing, one thing I'm not sure of how I wired it and I need to verify is how the ECU is able to command the cooling fans. I'm pretty sure I just have this end of it hooked up factory like it would be on a stock MR2. But the benefit of using a brushless fan motor is that it is PWM capable and I could control that if I had a solid state relay with the ECU. Oh my God. This is the hardest car I own to push, I think. I don't know, yeah, the Bronco's easier to push than this. This right here, plug this into my crap top. In order to know what I need to know to be able to know if this does what it should do, <laughs> I am not seeing cooling fan. I never hooked it up. So the cooling fans are just off of the factory temperature sensor. Basically the way this is wired, I do believe, is I have the temp sensor sending a signal to the cooling fan relay 
and then that triggers the cooling fan relay to close its contacts and power up the cooling fans. BGB wiring diagram, Raider fan air conditioner, full color booklet, main fan relay, fan relay number one, fan relay number two, fan relay number three, which means this thing runs in series for the low speed circuit, providing six volts to the cooling fans for half speed and parallel 12 volts for high speed. So since the AC amplifier is sending a positive potential to the coil of the fan relays, there really is no way I can make the standalone ECU tie into that and override and control the fan relay. And yeah, I did just get a haircut in the middle of the video. Maximize my time here, people. Volts DC, I should have 12 volts potential. If the battery is charged, that would be 12. All right, as I press this back in, it'll click the relay if you listen. Yep, you heard it. Terminal four, there we go. Voltage is present. Yep, clicked. Yeah, nothing. There was a small hiccup in my troubleshooting right here that I luckily caught by the end of the video, but I'm gonna leave it and see if any of you figure it out. There's literally one wire that goes from the fuse box sending potential out to the cooling fans for them to power up. I have voltage at the fuse box, nothing at the fan. Isolate the circuit by pulling the fuse. Continuity check the wire. 0 0.002 ohm, that's perfect. I don't normally open myself up for a rabbit hole like this, but when I do, I find out that these fans will not operate at half the voltage. Hello, it's the uh, following day. I picked up a new relay from the auto parts store, so hopefully this thing will last at least two weeks until the genuine Toyota Denso one arrives in the mail. Hopefully it'll get the job done temporarily. I'm no scientist, but I don't think that these brushless fans will operate in series off of just six volts. A simple math equation will tell me if these will provide enough resistance to make that possible, but I think these have a minimum 10 volt requirement. I'm I'm, I wanna see what the resistance is of this motor. I'm very curious. All right, these bad chickens should have power now. Oh, might help if I turn the key. All right, AC's on. Ohm's resistance. I would imagine this would change though as the soft start. I don't think I can just measure it. Yeah. Oh well. There's not a, there. It's open because I'm measuring a circuit card right now, not an actual motor winding. I could just Google how this thing works and try to explain it to you like I'm some kind of an expert, but I'm not gonna bullshit you like I know everything. All right. Turn off air conditioning. So the AC is off. ACC. No AC on. So I have 12 volts present at that motor. It's not turning on because it should be switched ground from the relay. Nothing on the other side though. Fan works. I suspect that relay number three is not getting anything. Yep, I have nothing. So fan relay three is not doing anything. That makes sense. That's why this is not working at all. This is quite possibly one of the most confusing things I've done in a while, yet it's so simple how this works. By applying a ground to fan relay number one, terminal one, as would the AC amplifier, this will put this into low speed and see whether or not these are capable of running at six volts. There we go, black wire and ground. Nothing. The workaround is to run this in parallel mode constant. So remove fan relay two. Do I have a matching wire? What do we got down here? 14 gauge. That's actually 12 gauge, it's bigger than I thought. And jump out ground. I gotta make sure I get this right or else I'm gonna short something out majorly. Try it out. Just gotta wait for this thing to get to 194 degrees and it should turn on. This thing's been running for about 25 minutes straight and it will not go above 193 degrees Fahrenheit. It got to 194 and I still only have the AC side fan running. The main radiator fan has not kicked on. So 
pretty efficient cooling system. I can't get the temperatures to rise above 194. As it sits with this jumper in place, the wiring setup is actually not too bad. So a low speed circuit or just air conditioning will be the left side fan. If the ECT engine coolant temp rises above 194 Fahrenheit, the second fan will kick on, providing both fans to cool. And thankfully, because I was an idiot, I was able to put the genuine Toyota Denso relay back in its place. It's good. So for now, it works. I was really dreading having to do this, but it's necessary. Aside from giving this thing an alignment, which I actually was considering trying to do an old fashioned string alignment here in the shop. If you guys are possibly interested in seeing something like that, let me know in the comment section below. But there's one small thing that I need to fix because I've been using my laptop as a gauge essentially until this was taken care of. I'm honestly not in love with the clamshell gauges anymore. I don't even need them with the standalone. I started this project seven years ago, and while it's kind of been finished, I hope that by the time the Celica is done, this will be done alongside right. it. <sighs> the reason I had to pull my gauge cluster is because something is bad in it because neither my boost gauge or the temperature gauge read correctly. They both just max out as soon as you start the car. As much as I wish it was as easy as just a sensor or a wiring issue, everything is good up to the cluster. So it's either the voltage regulator that's inside here or possibly just a bad track. It's gonna take some troubleshooting. As far as painting the bracket goes, that is uh, to a later date. The paint booth is currently full of un inoperable vehicles. The next and likely last video you might see on the MR2 before it gets tuned is gonna be addressing the gauges issue, as well as possibly doing something with the PWM circuit if I can figure out how without hacking up my factory wiring. But I know you guys want to see this, so I will start working on it tomorrow. Also, if you guys would like to support what you see here, I do not have major sponsors. I am self-funded. I pay for all these parts out of pocket and I have a couple MR2 shirts left on my website. If you would like to purchase those, once they're gone, they're all gone. I'm not printing any more of those. So thank you guys for watching. I'll see you soon with another. Bye.